The operators of Fukushima Daiichi have adopted a plan to reform the way their company operates. Officials at Tokyo Electric Power Company, or TEPCO, say it will make safety and disaster preparedness their top priorities. In the plan, TEPCO officials say they shouldn't have blamed the accident on natural causes because the tsunami was difficult to predict. They go on to recognize the meltdowns could have been prevented if they had been fully prepared for such an event. TEPCO President Naomi Hirosa says TEPCO needs to fundamentally change its approach to safety. We believe we don't have the right to operate nuclear plants if we fail to carry out these reforms. The water engineers have used to cool the reactors is contaminated and it's accumulating by the minute. The engineers are looking for ways to decontaminate that water. They're pinning their hopes on a new device. They'll start testing it this weekend. The engineers say the new device is better than older models because it can remove over 60 more radioactive substances. They have three of these devices. They're only testing one. They say they're taking a cautious approach. The engineers plan to test the device for about four months. They haven't said when they'll test the other two, nor when they'll put them into full-scale operation. TEPCO officials had wanted to start the trial in September. They postponed it because a storage vessel was unsafe. They got the go-ahead from nuclear regulators last week. Radioactive water is accumulating at a rate of 400 tons a day. TEPCO officials say the new device is vital for securing safety and protecting the environment from pollution. The nuclear accident forced many people to leave their homes. Some of those people died while they were living in temporary shelters. Government officials in charge of reconstruction say fatigue and stress damaged their health. The officials say 35 displaced residents of Fukushima Prefecture have died. They say all of them had to leave homes in the no-entry zones around the nuclear plant, and they say most were aged in their 60s to 80s. Fatigue from poor living conditions caused 25 deaths. Exhaustion from moving caused 13. Some evacuees had to move to new housing 16 times. Officials say they plan to send psychotherapists to temporary housing to give evacuees mental support. After the disaster at Fukushima's nuclear power plant, a lot of mothers living nearby made a difficult decision. They took their children and left their homes. They were concerned about local radiation levels, but that meant being separated from the fathers who stayed behind to work. About 10,000 mothers and children moved to nearby Yamagata, but now some mothers are rethinking their decision. When I moved here, I did it for the good of my children but through their behavior, they are telling me that 
what they really want is to be with their father. So I will honor their wishes. Mothers took their children away from Fukushima to protect their children's physical health. But some youngsters are paying a high price in emotional health. Now mothers like Makiko are forced to make a tough decision. Radiation levels in most parts of Fukushima where people live are roughly the same as elsewhere in Japan, but many residents remain concerned. In other news, a proud species commits suicide rather than being driven to extinction by humans. Google has released panoramic images of a town near the center of the nuclear crisis in Japan. Namie lies within the exclusion zone around Fukushima Daiichi and is abandoned. Google's Street View service now has 360 degree photos of the town. For many people around the world, it's a rare glimpse inside the no entry zone around the nuclear plant. The images show a shopping mall in the heart of the town littered with collapsed buildings two years after the earthquake and tsunami. Not a single one of the 21,000 residents can be seen. Google managers say recording and publicizing images from the area is their way of contributing to the reconstruction. Health authorities in Japan are struggling with an epidemic that's usually not seen in developed nations. The rubella virus is spreading. It causes a skin rash and fever, which usually goes away in a week. But if it's transmitted to pregnant women, their babies could be born with health problems. NHK World's Kaho Izumitani explains why this outbreak is happening now. Maiko Nishimura is facing the consequences of not getting a rubella vaccination. She caught the disease while she was pregnant. Her daughter, Hana, was born last fall with a hole in her heart. Worse, the doctor said Hana might grow up with limited hearing and eyesight. She would have been born healthy. It's all my fault. Since last October, parents of six other babies in Japan reported their children have similar symptoms. All of the cases have been linked to rubella. Health authorities say rubella is spreading across the country. The number of patients in the first 11 weeks of this year is nearly 22 times higher compared to the same period last year. Many of them are in their 20s to 40s. Currently, a fully funded program allows children to get two shots before entering elementary school. But back when Japanese in their 20s to 40s were children, the vaccination was either optional or only for girls. The concern is these adults who are at risk of catching rubella are of childbearing age, and so their children could be at risk too. Health officials are doing more to put out the information on the risks posed by rubella, but getting the people to find out if they need the vaccination and pay for it is still tough. The response has been low. Adults must pay around fifty to hundred dollars for each shot. Some local governments started covering part of the cost, but they require documentation and the number of clinics is limited. Infectious disease specialists say the current approach falls far short. They admit they should have seen this coming and the government should have prevented it. Japan has been providing funds and technologies for vaccines to other countries such as China and Vietnam. But what we're doing about rubella in Japan is like trying to put out a massive fire only with buckets of water. I can't help but wonder why our country doesn't protect its own children. Maiko Nishimura now shares her story on her blog. She wants others to take the precautions she wishes she had. I don't care if I'm thought of as a bad example. I want people to understand the effects of rubella on babies. I don't want any other mothers to go through what I did. Nishimura says 
she'll face a lifetime of regret. She hopes others will act before it's too late. Kaho Izumitani, NHK World, Tokyo. Experts say some types of rubella that Japanese are catching appear to have originated in other Asian countries, such as China and Vietnam, and have been spreading in those countries for more than a decade. Health authorities in Vietnam began an eradication campaign this year. Many people have reported medical problems since the Fukushima nuclear disaster began. Here's another problem. A nursery school in Fukushima City reports a sharp increase in the number of children with flat feet. The school blames restrictions on outdoor play. Torikawa Nursery School says it examined about 60 children aged between 3 and 5 last April, a year after the meltdown at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. It says 43% had developed flat feet, triple the pre-accident number. Flat foot is a condition that causes sufferers to tire easily because it reduces the foot's capacity to absorb impact. Outdoor activities for children in Fukushima Prefecture were restricted after the crisis began. Many nursery schools and kindergartens in the area keep the restrictions amid persistent concerns over radiation. Torikawa Nursery School says it allows children to play within its outdoor playground now that the whole compound has been decontaminated. But the school says children are banned from walking outside the school compound because decontamination of surrounding areas is not complete. Professor Kazuko Nakamura of the University of Yamanashi says the sharp fall in outdoor activities has damaged the children's feet. It wouldn't be a problem if kids could experience a variety of fun indoor activities to make up for the missed exercise. But everyone has to be creative to achieve that. The nursery school says it has shifted focus to indoor exercise. But the latest checkup earlier this month shows the rate of those with flat feet remains high at 32%. Nuclear experts have spent the past couple of years trying to understand exactly what went wrong at Fukushima Daiichi. The March 2011 earthquake and tsunami triggered meltdowns in three reactors. NHK has been investigating the chain of events during the accidents. We looked at how crews on site used fire engines to inject water to keep one reactor cool and why this plan failed. Workers at Fukushima Daiichi faced a station blackout on March 11, 2011. A loss of all backup power. Reactor 1 was the first unit to melt down. Reactors 3 and 2 followed. During our investigation, we learned that before the meltdown in Reactor 3, a battery continued to power the unit's emergency cooling system. Engineers with plant operator Tokyo Electric Power Company tried different ways to pump water into the unit before the battery died. None worked, so they decided to use fire engines. They manipulated valves in the facility's extensive piping system to make the injection process more efficient. They wanted the water to run through a single route. They began injecting water into Reactor 3 shortly after 9 a.m. on March 13th to try to prevent a meltdown. Water has been injected. The fuel rods are now safely covered with water. TEPCO engineers estimate crews injected more than 400 tons of water during the day. They considered it enough to keep the nuclear fuel cool. But Reactor 3 melted down anyway, that same day. What went wrong? Many pipes ran to and from Reactor 3. Engineers injected water into the unit using a route shown in light blue. A condenser spotted just off the route, here caught our attention. 
the device converts steam that's used in power generation back into water and sends it out. It usually holds very little water. But TEPCO disclosed later that a large amount of water was inside the condenser. We suspected some of that water was supposed to go into the reactor. NHK World asked experts to help conduct a close examination of Reactor 3 to check for possible leaks. We discovered a pump normally keeps water from getting into the condenser. But the power outage at the plant stopped the device from working. We have just found a leak on the way to the reactor. It was a blind spot. We wanted to find out how much water could enter the condenser instead of the reactor when the pump is off. So we went to the Siet Meteorological Lab in Italy to run a test. The facility is among the best in the world for simulating the high temperature and high pressure conditions inside nuclear reactors. Experts put together equipment to recreate the situation in Reactor 3 and to see where the injected water goes. Okay, we can start the acquisition. Right away, the water rushed toward the condenser. The results of the experiment showed that only 45% of the injected water reached the reactor and the rest leaked into the condenser. If we need to inject water into the reactor pressure vessel, uh, we need to avoid any leakage in the line. This is a, uh, an important topic and must be duly investigated. The experts estimate a meltdown could have been averted if 75% of the water had reached the reactor. The accident in Fukushima prompted utilities in Japan to deploy fire engines and water injection pumps at nuclear plants across the country. But our simulation shows that this is not enough to prevent a severe accident. There are still many questions about what happened at Fukushima Daiichi. Two years on, the search for answers and lessons continues. Japan's annual disaster drill this year will be based on a mega quake in the Nankai Trough of the Pacific Coast. The trough stretches from central to western Japan. It's been the site of large-scale earthquakes throughout history. The drill is held every year in September. The Government Council on Disaster Preparedness chose the Nankai Trough scenario. The March 2011 disaster has taught us to expect the unexpected. The drill will be based on the largest possible quake and tsunami. We want the public to be aware of the risks but remain calm. Experts say a huge earthquake in the trough would cut water supply to over 34 million people in 39 prefectures. It would also cause major food shortages. It's predicted that highways, railways and airports would be useless for several days. During the drill, all cabinet ministers will gather at emergency disaster headquarters in Tokyo. The government will also set up emergency task forces in Osaka and Kagawa prefectures. They'll oversee evacuation, rescue and relief efforts in areas that could be affected. The president of a Japanese power utility has announced he will scrap the building of a new nuclear plant in Fukushima Prefecture. The plant site of the Namie Odaka plant was only 10 kilometers north of Fukushima Daiichi. 
The president of Tohoku Electric Power Company, Makoto Kaiwa, conveyed his decision to cancel the plant to the Fukushima governor. After considering the situation and the feelings of the people of Fukushima, we have concluded that it would not be appropriate to proceed with the planned construction. The company president noted many evacuees are still forced to live in temporary housing. Governor Yuhei Sato said the decision is absolutely natural under current circumstances. He urged Tohoku Electric to instead make good use of the site for the reconstruction of Fukushima Prefecture. Tohoku Electric had been trying to win approval for the plant since 1968, but opposition from local communities surged following the disaster at Fukushima Daiichi. The Swiss Supreme Court has overturned a lower court decision and granted indefinite operation for an aging nuclear power plant on the condition that sufficient safety measures are taken. The case centers around anti-nuclear group demands that the Muhleberg nuclear plant near the capital Bern be shut down. The group says the plant has developed safety problems since coming online over 40 years ago. In March last year, the country's administrative court ordered the plant's operator, BKW, to shut down the facility by June this year. The utility appealed the ruling. The Supreme Court in Lausanne rejected the plaintiff's request on Thursday. The court permitted BKW to continue operating the plant on the condition that the power company implements enough safety measures to address problems raised by the plaintiffs. The court also required the operator to follow instructions by the country's nuclear safety regulators. In the wake of the 2011 Fukushima nuclear accident in Japan, the Swiss government decided to phase out all of the nation's five reactors by 2034. Public discussions are underway in Switzerland on how to secure energy sources to replace nuclear power. Scientists are gaining new ground in the fight against cancer. An international team of researchers has identified gene markers that could increase the risk of contracting three forms of the disease. More than 100 institutions from 34 countries took part in the study, including Britain's University of Cambridge and Japan's Aichi Cancer Center. The researchers conducted genetic tests on 200,000 people. They discovered alterations that could play a role in the development of breast, ovarian, or prostate cancer. They say certain genetic changes common in cancer patients are not seen in cancer-free individuals. The researchers found 41 mutations characteristic of breast cancer, 23 genetic signatures of prostate cancer, and two variations for ovarian cancer. Several science magazines have published the findings. The researchers say the genetic changes don't necessarily trigger cancer, but they believe each variation increases the risk. They say the study doubled the number of known genetic variants connected to cancer, and that's raising hopes for better screening for the disease.
German politicians are reconsidering their plans for a permanent nuclear waste storage facility. People living near the proposed site have expressed strong opposition to the idea. The site is in the district of Gora Leben. The, and right now, it's the only location being considered. Residents are concerned the radioactive waste could contaminate groundwater. Environment Minister Peter Altmaier says the government will form a panel to review the plan. Members will include people from environmental groups and religious organizations. They will draw up guidelines to help the government choose a candidate site by the end of 2015. They're going to reconsider Gora Laban as a possible location for the nuclear waste. Now, if you watched a video I made um, a little while back um, about the um, elections, the general elections being unconstitutional, well, we finally got our uh, second decision on this. And it appears the high court in Hiroshima Prefecture has taken it a step further. Not only have they uh, said that at least two uh, lower house elections in Hiroshima Prefecture were unconstitutional and invalid. Now, saying it's invalid, it's much stronger than the previous decision from the Tokyo High Court that declared the entire general election to be uh, unconstitutional. When they say it's invalid, that opens up the door to completely nullify the election results in those two prefectures. Now, it's expected there will be more uh, local elections for lower house deemed unconstitutional and invalid. But at this point, the uh, court had decided that they're going to leave the invalid ruling open until November 27th to give the election board time to correct the situation. So we should not expect anybody getting booed out of office and having a re-election anytime soon, especially if the election board corrects the problem, which is a voter disparity between um, many of the, the districts that are voting, right? So that's the huge problem. Now, who can invalidate or nullify the election? Well, the court can say it's invalid, but it takes a little bit more to get it completely nullified. Basically, if the court decides that, that invalid stands, the government must declare a new election. Now, if they do not declare a new election, the courts can override them, but it takes a lot to do that, right? So that's the situation we have here in Japan. More election results being declared unconstitutional and now invalid here in Japan. So get this word out, let people know that Shinzo Abe's government may well, very well turn out to be a completely illegitimate government here in Japan. Now, a newly appointed Bank of Japan governor is busy getting Japan's economy back on track and he made his points clear to the policy makers today. And Rob Madison from the Business Desk joins us now with that story. So what did he say? Yeah, that's right. Uh, the new chief has been pretty busy, as we've mm -hmm. seen over the past couple of days, really trying to get his message out. Uh, Yuko, now he's saying that the government must implement fiscal reform while the central bank eases credit more. Speaking to a parliamentary committee, Bank of Japan Governor Haruhiko Kuroda said the national debt has reached an unsustainable level of more than 200% of the country's gross domestic product. Japan is still in deflation and the economy has not fully recovered. So it is appropriate to use fiscal spending as a short-term stimulus, but it will not be sustainable over the medium to long term. Kuroda supports bold monetary easing, but he seems to be cautious about buying foreign bonds. He said other nations may not welcome such a step, as they may see it as an act of intervention in the currency markets.
Many Japanese mobile phone users were unable to contact their families in the hours after the earthquake and tsunami two years ago. Some base stations shut down. Now carriers are turning to renewable energy to power their stations during blackouts. Starting next month, engineers at NTT Docomo will test base stations equipped with solar panels and storage batteries. They say on sunny days, the facilities in Tokyo and two other prefectures can be fully powered by solar energy. And they can store surplus energy for up to 10 hours of use during the night or during blackouts. Technicians with Docomo have also installed wind turbines at a research facility. They'll study whether wind power can be used reliably at base stations. Our goal is to establish a disaster-proof, eco-friendly system that draws power from a mixture of energy, such as solar, wind or other latest green energy, instead of a single source. Managers at KDDI and SoftBank Mobile are also planning to launch base stations to harness renewable energy, but they'll have to overcome high startup costs.